My lords, ladies and gentlemen, please rise. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everyone's uh, comfortable on these uh, red benches. Um, this thing here the, um, is not quite as comfortable, I think, as yours, but there we are. Uh, my name is uh, Norman Fowler, and I'm the Lord Speaker. It's a role uh, that I was elected to in July 2016 uh, by my uh, peers here. And obviously, it involves sitting in the chamber uh, and uh, when we have debates. Above all today, I'm very pleased to welcome you all uh, to the House of Lords for this uh, important debate. It's the 11th time um, we have opened the chamber and invited those who are not members of the Lords uh, to come and express their views on the red benches. And uh, I'm delighted that the House of Lords is hosting this intergenerational event with representatives from the British Council the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association Headquarters, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association UK, uh, Commonwealth Common Ties Network, and the Royal Commonwealth Society. And we've got students here today from uh, Archbishop Beck Catholic College, Liverpool, from Broxburn Academy, Edinburgh, from Cardinal Wiseman Roman Catholic High School, London, uh, from uh, Deaston uh, School, Market Raisin, uh, from uh, Holy Family Catholic School in Sixth Form, uh, London, Hunter House College, Belfast, Newham Sixth Form College, London, Queen's Mary Grammar School uh, in Walsall, Turnbull High School, Glasgow, and Whitley Bay High School, Tyneside. So, you've travelled from all over the, the United Kingdom to uh, share your thoughts and opinions on the important issues um, of the United Kingdom's role in international relations, and I'm looking forward, and so I know my colleagues, uh, to hearing uh, your views and personal experiences. I'd perhaps just say a few words about the format um, of today's debate. First, we're going to start with a vote to see what you think now before the debate has actually uh, begun. And uh, Christine, Salmon uh, Percival, sitting opposite me, will be timing the speeches uh, today using the digital clock. Christine also has a bell to signal you are running out of time or you have run out of time. We don't actually use that in House of Lords debates, but frankly, at times, I think it would be <laughs> a very good idea if we did. <clears throat> we will open with uh, six main speeches from three different teams who will each address the primary question underpinning today's debate from a different uh, perspective. That question, what are the challenges for international relations in the 21st century, will then be opened up to the floor when I'll be calling on some people by name, uh, but others simply raise their hands if they wish to make contribution, and we'll try and get as many of you in as we conceivably uh, can do. Um, if you do wish to speak during the floor debate, uh, could I ask you to clearly raise your hand, and if I select you, please tell us who you are, select, state your name. And I'll also remind you that you should speak for the option uh, you agree or disagree with. It doesn't matter um, uh, where in the chamber that you're um, actually uh, seated. And please take note to abide by the rules um, of uh, a debate. I have some rules here, but I think you know most of them, about being constructive and respectful. And it says here, please don't swear, but I wasn't thinking most of you would, actually, uh, in this uh, uh, context. <coughs> Following the floor debate, uh, we will have the closing summary, speeches after which a chance to vote again for the option that you find most compelling. In other words, we will know what impact the debate has had uh, upon your voting. Now, those of you uh, on the red benches now have the opportunity to vote for the options to test what everyone thinks before the debate begins. There will be three votes, 
and you may vote only once. Please raise your hands clearly so that the doorkeepers uh, can uh, see you and count uh, your vote. And as you remember, there are three perspectives. Perspective one, the United Kingdom should aim to work closely with the Commonwealth, European countries, the European Union and global partners to achieve common regional aims. So raise your hands if you're in favour of that perspective one. Okay, everyone finished counting. Thank you very much <coughs> indeed. Carry on, please, Lord. Yeah, we're ready. So, please raise your hand now to vote for perspective two. The United Kingdom should aim to be a global leader. Okay, thank you very much for that. And uh, perspective three, the United Kingdom should keep the affairs of other countries at a distance and focus on its own problems. Those in favour of that. Okay, well, we'll now see how it uh, ends up at the end of the debate if uh, those uh, figures uh, come through uh, to the uh, final vote. And the votes so far are uh, vote one, um, that is the first um, option, was 124 votes. For the second, 37 votes and for the third, 12 votes. So um, the uh, first, thank you very much. The first perspective um, is at the moment um, winning by quite a high margin, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what it's, how it's all going to end. So we're now gonna start, therefore, um, our debate. Opening speakers will be given up to three minutes to make their case uh, for, a particular, for their particular motion. Christine will ring the bell once they have 30 seconds left, and as I said, uh, twice uh, at the end of their uh, three minutes. Now, i get this thing, there we are. Once I've called on each speaker, it is very important, if I may say so, that you give encouragement to those speakers and show your appreciation by offering them a, a big round of applause. And as I said to most of you, I think, before uh, this meeting, please don't be overawed uh, by these uh, splendid uh, surroundings. It is a debating chamber, and uh, just forget uh, about, uh, for this moment, at any rate, about the history and all the pomp that kind of goes with it. So, I'd now like to call upon uh, Meg Wishart to open the case for Perspective 1. The UK should aim to work closely with the Commonwealth, European countries, the EU and global partners to achieve common regional aims. Meg. Thank you, Lord Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Meg Wishart and I am from Broxburn Academy. We live in an era where the human race is growing at an unprecedented scale. 
During the 21st century, the challenges we will be presented with will be international and alarming. Every individual within this chamber will be impacted by climate change. There is nothing we can do independently to defend ourselves. Individually, we are powerless. Our very existence is endangered by climate change. Our homes, our families, our friends, everything of importance. Since 2008, over 21 million people have been, forcibly, have been forcibly displaced as a result of climate change. This should not be a situation which separates them and us. There should only be an us. And whilst we're unable to control these events as individuals, as one country, as one unified human race, we can control them. Working meticulously with our global partners around the world will enable us to safeguard people's homes, their families, their friends. Undoubtedly, everyone here today has witnessed the devastation that has plagued the people of Syria in recent years. We have all witnessed the harrowing plight of refugees in a desperate search for safety. It is almost impossible to forget the images of a drowned toddler washed upon a Greek island. This is a heartbreaking representation of what happens when countries do not work together. He was deprived of his childhood because EU countries did not work together to safely transport refugees. Instead, the EU became a benevolent shroud behind which individuals were able to neglect their responsibilities. EU countries should have worked in conjunction to accept and resettle our refugees evenly throughout Europe, consequently ensuring single countries were overwhelmed in comparison to their population. EU countries should have implemented a system to allow refugees to cross the Mediterranean without having to resort to smugglers. Italy did have an operation called Mari Nostrum, which did this, but due to a lack of financial assistance, it was abandoned. Because we didn't work closely together with the EU, thousands of people were deprived of their future. So what does this mean for our future? The Syrian refugee crisis is abominable, however, it will pale in comparison to the crisis due to those seeking refuge as a consequence of climate change in the next few decades. Countless projections see regions of sub-Saharan Africa evolving to be entirely uninhabitable. This will displace millions of people. To solve this, the UK has the moral responsibility to work in conjunction with our global partners to preemptively act against this. For example, to, Im to implement policies such as setting up safe zones in North Africa for refugees to be processed. It is our moral responsibility to bring our refugees to areas of safety. These are not innovative policies, so why are they not happening already? These are not happening because people are more concerned with their own lives. There has to be public support. So most significantly, we need to work in union with our global partners to, enab to, to enable the refugees to integrate into society and be welcomed. This is not an issue that can be solved without difficulty. However, resistance towards aiding others is a concept founded primarily on learned behaviours. The solution? The UK must work closely with other nations which will generate a positive example for our people. Regardless of our differences, we are still all one human race. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm now going to uh, call upon uh, Emily McConnell to open the case for Perspective 2. The UK should aim to be a global leader. Emily. Good afternoon, Lord Speaker, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Emily McConnell and I'm from Hunter House College, Belfast. The UK should aim to be a global leader. What is a global leader, or what should a global leader look like? What about a nation that educates one in four leaders of the world, or a nation that, despite its size, has the third largest diplomatic service in the world, or a nation that is ranked second in the world for higher education and science? Or what about a nation that gives 0.7% of its gross national income to overseas aid, despite outcries even from its own people? That, Lord Speaker, honoured guests, is the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. It is indeed the case that the United Kingdom should aim to be a global leader, but we should not forget that it is one already. Not that we should dwell on the past, as if legacy is all we had to offer, but we should take courage in the truth that is our great nation. We should not let the narrative of decline dominate our mindset as it dominates our television and tablet screens. We should not be misled by the fake news from media sources that lie in our own country and farther afield. We need to tell the truth. 
about ourselves and to ourselves. What are some of those truths? We have educated one in four of today's world leaders. Why did they come to the United Kingdom? It is because we are a global leader. We have more universities in the top 10, 100 and 200 than any other country except the United States. In the edu educational index, we come third only after the United States and Germany. We have more Nobel Prize winners than any other country except, you guessed it, the United States. So as well as the United States, we are a global leader in the realm of education. And we are willing to share. The United Kingdom knows that not everyone who needs a good education will be a global leader or will or be able to afford to come to our great universities. But the United Kingdom cares about the illiterate and downtrodden across the globe. Spending 0.7% of our gross international income means that we are proud to be a global leader in, in world compassion. Art helps provide not only fresh water, but fresh opportunities, opportunities for liberty and control over one's life. Liberty is something to be prized and something to be desired in a global leader. Our geopolitical strength will enable us to wield our soft power to help continue to bring increasing liberty and improved governance across the world. With continued investment in all that makes our United Kingdom great, great, we should not only aim to be, but continue to be an outstanding global leader. Thank you. Thank you very much again. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. Uh, now, um, the next speaker, I would like to call upon Elizabeth uh, Negus, and she is going to open the case for Perspective 3, the UK should keep the affairs of other countries at focus on its own problems. Elizabeth. Thank you, Lord Speaker. Fellow debaters, my name is Elizabeth Negus from the Royal Commonwealth Society. I fervently believe that the UK should focus on its affairs here at home instead of focusing on the problems of other countries. On the 23rd of November 1918, a well-known politician asked, what is our task? This was followed by to make Britain a fair country for heroes to live in, end of quote. <coughs> the 21st century has presented Britain with problems of such great magnitude that finding solutions seems virtually impossible. Globalization and the increasing rise in technology have contributed to the immigration crisis, homelessness, joblessness, religious conflict, to name but a few. These issues have put a tremendous strain on Great Britain. Consequently, it stands to reason that if we are to help and support other countries, we must first and, for and foremost strengthen our economy, in particular our health and education departments. UK public spending faces continued, f continued funding shortages, and with Brexit looming on the economic horizon, will further weaken our personnel and resources. Just look around and think about Britain in the 19th century when it was a great empire. A strong country can do unprecedented deeds for countries impoverished by wars, famine, sickness, etc. So key to Britain's survival, I believe, in the 21st century means focusing on its own affairs instead of interfering with the problems of other countries. Thank you for listening. Thank, thank you very much indeed, Elizabeth. And now, to continue the debate, I would like to call on Michelle Hurd to continue the case for uh, Perspective One. As you remember, that is that the UK should aim to work closely with Commonwealth European countries, the EU and global partners. 
to achieve common regional aims. So, uh, Michel Hurd. Thank you. That the UK should aim to work closely with the Commonwealth, European countries, the EU and global partners to achieve common regional aims is even more critical today than at any other time in the past. The challenges that international terrorism brings, conflicts through the Middle East and tensions between global powers will require a collaborative and cooperative response with the widest range of countries and international alliances to secure peace and security at home and abroad. Taking an isolationist position at this stage would bring a greater threat to the UK security and long-term peace. This is not to minimise or sideline other global challenges, such as climate change, for example. But securing peace and security underpins tackling other international priorities. While the UK must invest in its own security via its armed forces and strategic defence policy, at a recent G20 summit, a leading politician reminded participants that all international terrorism knows no borders and is a threat to us all. The UK has a history of working closely with others to tackle shared threats and has accomplished much as an active partner in NATO, the world's most successful defence and peacekeeping organisation. Its contribution to a number of stabilisation and reconstruction programmes following international conflicts and more recently its role in creation of the G20 Group of Nations, are witness to this. The latter has enabled joint com commitment and actions in tackling 21st century international terrorism through greater sharing of information and data and the setting up of the Financial Action Task Force tackling the financing of terrorism. If effective action on global threats like terrorism can also take place more indirectly. The British Council is the UK's international cultural relations organisation, acting preventively through culture, education and civil society programmes in order to change the course of individual lives. By giving people positive and constructive routes through life, communities and ultimately nations are strengthened. Strong, stable and democratic nations that are responsive to their citizens' needs can contribute greatly to tackling terrorism and other threats to international order. These examples demonstrate the essential requirement of international collaboration to achieve regional aims, specifically if the UK is to develop a long-term response to achieving peace and security on a global basis, it has to maintain and potentially expand its alliances and collaborations with others to address the root cause of instability worldwide. Economic prosperity, tackling poverty and disease, all rely on this collaboration approach. But there cannot be pro prosperity, the eradication of poverty and disease, without security and peace, first and foremost. Michelle, thank you very much indeed for that. And I'm now going to call on Praise Johnson to continue the case for Perspective 2, the UK should aim to be a global leader. Thank you, Lord Speaker. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Praise Johnson, and I am from Archbishop Beck College from Liverpool. To discuss whether the UK should aim to be a global leader, first you must determine what it means to actually be a world leader in the first place. Global leaders today help advance the world, be it through fashion or technology. The definition of what makes a global leader is wide-ranging, but they all boil down to one thing. They reflect an aspect of the ideal. To be a global leader means being a point of reference for what the masses need, such as ideal healthcare and education. While they may not be the actual utopia of what is wanted, they will still reflect the best exemplary model desired. To lead the world in education, economics, and even healthcare would mean that domestically the standard would have to be high. Therefore, the first group to benefit from this increase in standards would be those living in the UK. In so many ways, the UK is already regarded as a global leader. Look at our values. The rule of law underpins the legal and practical structure in so many countries. We are in the mother of all parliaments. The Westminster model, the Westminster model influencing parliamentary democracy all over the world. 
On the domestic front, our established National Health Service is admired internationally. Currently, the NHS stands to emerge as a world leader in digital health, pioneering a direction for other countries. What I'm trying to say is, as our current position in the world, with our great assets, it is our duty to aim to become a better global leader, to help the lives of, all, of many around the world. And we have the assets in our, in our nation to do so. For example, our strong economy, the fourth largest in the world, will allow us to specialise in banking, high technology, complex electronics. Now that we have withdrawn, withdrawn from the EU, we can establish trade with 192 countries and establish new deals. On diplomacy, taking greater lead in the US, UN Security Council will allow us to field more diplomatic missions and allowing us, for example, we can now uh, establish peace, talk, peace talks in the Middle East. And on military, for a small nation, we have an extremely advanced military, which will allow us to hold peacekeeping operations and, can deal with, and we can deal with global threats if necessary. As a final result, we can aim to have a better, <laughs> as a final result, we can aim and contribute towards progress all over the world and the betterment of society. We cannot let the betterment of human lives be confined to citizenship. Thank you very much. I praise, thank you very much for that. And um, I'm now going to call on uh, Marie Gabrielle Bondo to continue the case for a perspective uh, three, that the UK should keep the affairs of other countries at a distance and focus on its own problems. Lord Speaker and fellow debaters, my name is Miriam Gabrielle and I am from Holy Family Catholic School. Imagine a world where thousands of people are homeless. You can't even get to a train station without someone begging for money. You can't receive the healthcare you need. Well, ladies and gentlemen, you don't need to imagine it because it's the world we're living in now. My house believes that the UK should keep the affairs of other countries at a distance and focus on its own problems. Thus, I'd like to clarify some things, such as the UK will remain in all the organisations they are part of as, so, as of currently, such as the Paris Climate Agreement and many more, as the UK has to honour its commitments. <coughs> on to my first point. For many years, the NHS has been neglected by the government. They have failed to fund the NHS with a sufficient amount of money to the point where it has become a humanitarian crisis. A British organisation says the NHS is facing a humanitarian crisis as hospitals and ambulance services struggle to keep up with the rising demand. For example, patients not having enough beds and waiting for trolleys and assistance. Our junior doctors are not being paid enough for the amount of hours they work. They get paid less than the average wage in the UK. This is abomination. How can some of the most skilled people in our society be, be neglected and underpaid? How can we focus on other countries' humanitarian problems when the UK has its own to solve? My second point is that the UK should not get involved with other countries' affairs because of what has happened in the past. In the past, the UK has taken it upon themselves to help other countries, but somehow hindering them. India is a good example. Because at one point, the relationship between India and Britain was that they were trading partners. But then, by 1858, India was under direct rule of the British Crown. Millions f During that period of time, Britain helped India with infrastructure. However, Britain took millions from taxpayers and took advantage and exploited people who could not pay their taxes. The people were, like treated, were treated like second class in their own country. This is why the UK should not get involved with other countries' affairs, because when they do, they often overstep the mark. What Britain did to India is still affecting some of the most poor people in their society. Majority of the time, when Britain gets involved with other countries, it ends badly. To conclude, my house believes that the UK should keep the affairs of other countries at a distance and focus on its own problems. I urge for you all to agree with my House's motion. Thank you for listening. Well, thank you very much indeed for that. And could I just thank uh, all the opening speakers for the way that they put their case and also the way they kept <coughs> to time, uh, which um, 
as my colleagues here will know, it is extraordinarily unusual uh, in this House. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we will now begin the floor debates where uh, there are contributions from uh, pre-prepared uh, speakers, those whose name I will call out. Uh, those should be no longer than 30 se uh, 90 seconds each, 90 seconds. But those of you wishing to make impromptu contributions and whose hand I select from those raised may take also up to 90 seconds to speak. And Christine will uh, ring the bell once to signal that you are out of time. And please, if you're speaking uh, from the back benches and your name hasn't been announced, if you can let us know um, um, who you are. Um, as I also should say, as I mentioned this morning, in line with normal uh, Lord procedure, I will be handing over at some stage in these, que in these points to my colleague Lord Lexton, who is just there, one of our deputy speakers during the floor debate, but I'll uh, be uh, rejoining you uh, later. Now, I've said to uh, state your name before making uh, your uh, point, but first I'd like to call on uh, Charlotte Marriott to continue the argument for Perspective One. Charlotte. Hello, my name is Charlotte Marriott and I'm from D. Aston Secondary School. Lord Speaker, fellow debaters, the Commonwealth, European Union, European countries and global partners are significantly important in terms of achieving common regional aims. As someone who lives within the United Kingdom, I don't just believe that these aims will benefit just us, but our surroundings. It will help us as a society grow overall. For example, the Commonwealth provides a space where big and small nations can speak as equals. It is a voluntary association and allows everyone to have a voice. Additionally, the Commonwealth encourages mem developing members to raise their standard of democracy, rights and governance, all 52 members to come to a collective agreement. Furthermore, despite popular belief, the Commonwealth does not just consist of countries from the former British colony, but includes new members <coughs> such as Rwanda and Mozambique and many more. Moreover, Her Majesty the Queen said on Commonwealth Day, the cornerstones on which peace is founded is quite simply respect and understanding for one another. By working together, we build peace by defending the dignity of every individual and community. This is one of the more popular regional aims. And as the Queen said, and I quote, working together, we build peace. On the 12th of September 2017, the UK offered a deep security partnership with EU post-Brexit in the face of growing global threats, with the aims of working closely to prevent illegal migration, terrorism, cyber and state-based threats. By creating this partnership, not only are we working closely to achieve said aims, but we're also working closely to an alliance with the European Union. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I think that's uh, notable for a number of reasons. I think it's the first time anyone's mentioned Brexit um, uh, up to now, which is uh, extraordinarily unusual in these, de uh, these debates. Now, I'm going to now take a uh, view uh, from the floor. Please raise your hand if you would like to uh, uh, speak. Gentlemen there. Thank you very much, Lord Speaker, and uh, good afternoon, fellow debaters and lords in the chamber here today. Uh, 70 years ago this year, the UK formally legislated to end its rule over the nation states of India and Pakistan. While this can only have been right and just in, in the historic assessment afterwards, Britain had seemingly entered an identity crisis in decades since to forge a new role for itself in the changing landscape. Without the clout and imperial right across continents, there would be only decline in our, in our fortunes and worldwide perception. This is simply untrue. Yes, I accept we have certainly declined in relative terms, and some might chide this down as talking Britain down in one form or another, and these detractors often overlook the readjustment of the UK to use its power for the development of other nations alongside our international allies, namely through soft power. Whether it be through our role in establishing the European Convention on Human Rights, sadly much undervalued these days, or the support of empowerment of countries facilitated by the 0.7% of foreign aid, we can take heart in our, cap our capacity for altruism and base of influence. And today also coincidentally is, the, is also World AIDS Day for those who are not aware. 
Um, Britain has changed, and the days have gone when power was a byword for domination and supremacy. And whilst we cannot cure the world ills of in our international with our international allies, we now co we now coexist among world partners to stand for humanity and for hope, open hearts and minds in acting as a global ally. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now I'm going to now call upon Francis uh, Omani Ekers to argue for perspective two. Fra Lord Speaker, fellow debaters, my name is Francis Omani Ekers and I am from Whitley Bay High School in Tyneside. I'm going to start my speech by defining what a modern day global leader looks like. A global leader sets an example to the rest of the globe of what a peaceful and successful society looks like and to aid other countries when needed. It doesn't necessarily mean building a, um, an empire and enforcing our power on other countries. We should aim to do this because we are the fifth largest economy in the world out of 195 other countries, which we can all agree it, for us is very beneficial. But why not share this strength and success, and success with other people in other countries who need it equally as much, if not more, than us? We could, do, we could use this to aid humanitarian crises, <coughs> such as the um, persecution of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, and to advocate for people who don't have people to advocate for them. As a diplomatic, powerful country, we don't necessarily need to use the physical force of the military, but we could use this to aid other country through the means, such, other means such as communication or more extremely things like economic sanctions. If we advocate for peace globally, it will cause other countries to follow. And with a domino effect, hopefully other countries will follow and eventually the world will become a better place for everyone globally and help everyone prosper. Thank you very much indeed. And now a view from the floor. Please raise uh, hands. Uh, lady there. Good afternoon, Lord Speaker. My name is Thranaini, and I am the British Youth Council's UK Young Ambassador to the Commonwealth. I'm also a guest um, of the Royal Commonwealth Society. I chose to stand for the position of Young Ambassador to the Commonwealth and work to raise UK youth voice within the Commonwealth as I strongly feel that Britain should work with the Commonwealth and other global partners in order to create positive change um, through collaboration. This is why I am advocating for Motion 1. The Commonwealth embodies almost a third of the world's population and is predominantly made up of young people where over 60% are aged under 30. With such a strong network bursting with refreshing, rich and diverse thoughts, why shouldn't we harness this opportunity to work together and achieve regional aims? The UK will be hosting the Commonwealth Youth Forum for the first time in history this April 2018, and the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting um, will be held after. This provides the greatest opportunity for us to move forward, challenge ideas and be challenged, um, as well as working with a vibrant group of countries to discuss prosperity, sustainability, fairness and security. Unity is the biggest strength, which is why I believe that the UK, working closely with the Commonwealth, EU and other global partners, will be the right choice. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, now I'd like to call uh, Daniel Southern to argue for Perspective 3. Daniel. Lord Speaker, fellow debaters. For too long, the taxpayer has had a huge proportion of their income taken away in order to provide support to other countries. Now, I'm not saying helping foreign countries is bad. However, we are currently in a crisis. More and more employed people are having to visit food banks in order to survive. The fact that workers can't even afford basics like food and water proves that we cannot afford to help other countries. 2016 figures show that we paid £13 billion in foreign aid. 
Why are we spending an unnecessarily large sum of money on other countries rather than using it to support our country, our economy, our people? We need to focus on making Britain strong and wealthy, and then, and only then, we can begin to help other countries. Now, even if we could afford to give foreign aid, which we can't, whenever we try to help out with foreign crises, we don't seem to have much success. An example of this is our intervention in Afghanistan, which only led to the deaths of innocent people and British soldiers. We tend not to be impartial when dealing with conflict. Another example of this is how we choose to ignore the human rights abuse in Saudi Arabia. We only ever tend to make problems worse for other countries, and therefore it is in everyone's best interest that the British focus on our own economy, our own people, and our own problems. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, going on to a debate uh, on the floor, um, who would like to come next? Uh, yes, sir, there, just here. Thank you, Lord Speaker. Fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Serena O'Keen and I'm from Broxburn Academy, and my contribution to the debate is as follows. The United Kingdom should aim to be a global leader as the main challenge we face today is neglect. Neglect of responsibilities, neglects of the right of others, neglect of international incidents. One simply has to look at the news to see that all major incidents reported are from that of Western countries, not poorer ones. We seen pray for Paris, we seen pray for Manchester, we did not see pray for Lebanon or countries similar to that situation. Just this week it came out that African citizens are being sold as slaves in Libya and this has only received attention due to shares on social media, not through major news outlets. If the UK stood up vocally against this, would it stop? We can't be sure, but we must try. We cannot sit back and do nothing. To quote a famous London artist, whose parents are from Nigeria, one of the countries where people are being stolen and sold as slaves, that's not me, and I believe it should not be the rest of us either. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now another from the floor. Uh, the uh, lady right over there, that's it. Thank you, Lord Speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kanika Thakur and I am a representative of the Royal Commonwealth Society. I would like to speak in favour of the role of United Kingdom in building relations in the 21st century by working in close collaboration with the Commonwealth countries as well as the European Union. I would like to bring your focus on the two most important things. Firstly, terrorism. The human race is facing a major threat, and that is the terror threat. The conflicts in the Middle East and the recent London and Manchester attacks signify that this is a problem not only for the Commonwealth and the developing nations, but it is a major problem for the developed nations, including UK and US. Secondly, UK has a very tangible role to play in the achievement of sustainable development goals set up by the United Nations, which includes poverty, homelessness, and climate change, to name a few. The history of Europe strongly signifies that when people come together, great things are done. Hence, UK working in close collaboration with other countries is needed to achieve not only the regional aims, but also that of security and international peace. Working together, we can bring peace and protect the integrity of every individual, and this can be made possible only by practical and tangible collaborations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I'm going Namia uh, uh, is she here? Oh yes, here we are. Thank you, Lord Speaker. Um, we now mark 99 years since women gained the vote, and over 50 since discrimination was outlawed. And yet we live in a society as fragmented as ever, where every day seems to bring a fresh new crisis, and yesterday is to simply be lost. If we go back just a year, only one topic dominated the country. And yes, it was a momentous decision that will shape years to come, but it demonstrates an internalistic mindset that shows just how easily we forget about the rest of the world. 
And that's a risk we can't afford to take well, with issues that affect us all. See, I'm a proud British Bangladeshi, but I watch as climate change fuel disasters ravage my country and 8.5 million people, destroying livelihoods and even lives. Bangladesh lies helpless in the midst of its flooding. Meanwhile, we see the brutal ethnic cleansing of Rohingya Muslims and 130 innocent Yemeni children dying daily in a crisis we are complicit in. These are two of the most devastating humanitarian crises ever, to we, ever that we have faced, and yet we are doing nothing. Have we become desensitized? Seeing a Syrian child washed up on shore doesn't seem to make us cry anymore. But it doesn't have to be this way. The UK can champion global partnerships across the world and challenge these issues. Despite decades of colonialization, the Commonwealth reminds an exciting partnership of rising states. And with 60% of its population being under 30, its potential is limitless. So let's approach these tumultuous times with an outward perspective, a determination to embrace our differences, and a desire to be part of a generation that truly worked together to create a legacy of hope. Thank you. And now uh, a view from the floor. Let me get someone right over there, right, right at the back in the, with a white shirt. Thank you, Lord Speaker. My name is Ben Carr and I'm from Queen Mary's Grammar School. And I put it to you all that the United Kingdom has a moral responsibility to be a global leader. In days not too far gone by, we were once the colonial rulers of the world, holding over a quarter of the world's population and landmass. We must not forget this, though we must not dwell on our past. We must ensure that these nations continue to prosper and continue to grow. Whilst they are not there yet, it is our duty to bring this to them as a world leader. I need not remind you that many countries that were former colonies of the United Kingdom are now in dire states. It is up to us to save them. No other nation cares enough. There are so many debates like this going on in the world now where the right wing seem to win and we seem to abandon what we hold so dear. To neglect our responsibility in the world as a global leader is to neglect what built this house, is to neglect what built this nation, is to neglect what built the world, the United Kingdom. Thank you. Another view from the floor. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Lord Speaker. My name is Mohammed Ahmad. I'm Associate Fellow Member of and from the Royal Commonwealth Society. In the, in the light of the current challenges being faced by the United Kingdom, one of the challenges is the risk which has been posed after the Brexit is that UK may be working in some isolation, if not complete isolation. Now, it is extremely important for us to work closely with the Commonwealth, the European countries, and other global partners to achieve a secure and prosperous future for our children. In relation to the Commonwealth, it forms a diverse group of 52 countries, which include developed and developing countries. These markets offer a wealth of opportunities to United Kingdom's businesses in all sectors, <clears throat> from primary sector to tertiary sector which certainly shows working closely with these countries will help us achieve stronger and more united Britain. Moving on to the European countries, the UK has a strong history of collaborating with the European partners on science and innovating through the EU pan-European and bilateral initiatives. To make the most after this overture, to continue scientific collaboration with the EU, the government must push and start making firm commitments on migration, regulations, and scientific funding that push in the same directions to ensure the UK truly benefits from being a partner of European countries. Mr. Lord Speaker and my fellow debaters, this clearly shows that it is for our benefit to maintain this partnership with global partners to achieve common regional aims. Thank you. Very many thanks. Uh, I'd now like to call on Kato Donovan uh, to speak in favour of Perspective 2. Thank you, Lord Speaker. Fellow debaters, my name is Katie Donovan and I'm from Broxburn Academy in Scotland. 
I passionately believe that the UK, acting as a global leader, can make the world we all live in a better place. We see a multitude of problems around the world that no one is dealing with. I believe the UK should stand up and be counted. We have a strong history of working against injustice. We stood against fascism and defeated Nazi Germany. We stood against communism and authoritarian regimes in the Cold War. Why should we not stand against injustice today? If we won't, who will? Muslims are facing forced relocation and ethnic cleansing in Myanmar. The shocking civil war in Syria, Syria rages on, creating more and more refugees. Violence against women is still prevalent around, all around the world. And while our country isn't without fault, I still believe we must stand up and lead the fight against these injustices. We cannot be passive bystanders <coughs> in such an iniquitous world. It seems like almost a daily occurrence that we see more and more stories of sexual harassment from people in positions <coughs> of power. This all came from one person being brave enough to stand up and act against injustice. If we are to stand up, if we are to challenge injustice around the world, it could have a snowball effect. An example is that the UK has controversial trade deals with countries where women are seen as second class citizens. If we set an example of not dealing with countries that with these countries, that, that could be a positive force for the good in the world. There are people all around the world just waiting for someone to stand up for them. That should be the UK. We must learn lessons from history. We must take up the role of a global leader. We must speak out for those who do not have a voice. Thank you. And now a further view from the up floor. Yes. Thank you, Lord Speaker. My name is Ivan Stebluk, and I'm representing the University of Worcester. I extend my thanks to the Royal Commonwealth Society for the invitation. Today, I will be arguing in favour of the UK withdrawing from the affairs of foreign nations, instead focusing on the problems within. The idea of Pax Britannica has existed since the early 1800s, when Britain held the empire, an idea that is still mentioned today by many politicians in this house. I believe this ideal is outdated. The current party line still seems to focus on the UK be being the world's hegemon. The unparalleled access to social media and information has plainly changed politics. People now have the ability to pass instant judgment on all, all foreign policies. Any in intervention is scrutinised to the microscopic level. Think of the shelling in Gaza and drone strikes in Syria. Getting straight to the point, Western colonialism and neocolonialism is undeniably responsible for considerable destruction of human lives most performed in the name of democracy and freedom. To illustrate my point, 55 million people have been killed as a direct result of Western-initiated wars and pro-Western coups since World War II. That's equivalent to the entire population of the UK in 1968 being wiped out. Hundreds of millions of more die silently in starvation and poverty. So why continue to engage in influence of foreign governments? In the politically unstable time, isolationism and the creation of manufacturing jobs is the answer. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, I'd now like to uh, call upon Marianne Hamill uh, to speak for Perspective 3. Lord Speaker, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, I am Marianne Hamill from Hunter House College, Belfast. The United <coughs> Kingdom is a nation full of animal lovers, so let me present my argument with this analogy. If I decided to adopt a puppy, it would be imperative that I attend an interview with the sanctuary. I would have to prove I am wise, level-headed and financially capable. <coughs> but the key question is, can I take care of myself? Never mind a puppy. If those are small questions asked to adopt a puppy, let's ask these same questions about the UK's capability to feed, train, shelter and clean up after the other nations of the world, especially when they've left a horrendous mess all over the floor. It's about time we put a leash on this. Let's be real. Let's look at the UK. Are we even capable of looking after ourselves? Are we even capable of looking after our people? never mind the nations of the world. We talk about feeding other nations. Look at our food banks. We talk about bringing shelter to other nations. Look at our homeless. We talk about bringing peace to other nations. 
yet enjoy being at each other's throats. I wouldn't let the UK look after a puppy, never mind lead global affairs. If we don't have our own house in order, the puppy will just bite us back. Very many thanks. Uh, a further contribution from the uh, floor. Yes. Uh, hello, good afternoon, Lords, fellow debaters. I'm Harry Cook from uh, Whitley Bay High School, Tyneside. Now, I'm here to talk about the UK and Europe, and I believe I'm the uh, first of the speakers to mention Brexit by name. I do this with no joy. I get as bored as it as you do, but still. <laughs> Uh, the UK and Europe have caused many wars throughout our history, especially our colonialism years. All of the problems that previous speakers have mentioned have been caused by us and other European countries. It is not only <coughs> our moral right, but our obligation to now fix the problems that we have caused. We don't have to do this alone either. Whether or not we leave the EU is not an issue because we still have one common ground. We are European. We have a history together. We have lives together. And so I, th I believe these issues can be fixed by working together. As a previous speaker mentioned, we have a huge amount of diplomats that go around the world in order to debate and f try and fix these issues. We have so many other issues that can be fixed that are not just these issues that we have caused. Climate change and other very important issues must be fixed and we cannot do this alone and we cannot only focus on ourselves in order to fix these things. Our relationship with other countries that we have not only helped found but have given independence to really should, become, really should come first and we should really help them. Thank you. I'd now like to uh, ask Emma Skelton to contribute to this debate. Lord, Lord Speaker, fellow debaters, trust is the basis of all relationships, be that between people or between countries. As the UK navigates its departure from the EU, trust will be crucial to Britain forging or maintaining relationships with other countries. Increased levels of trust are associated with increased interest in doing business with the UK, visiting the UK as a tourist, and studying in the UK. Various studies also show links between increased trust and increased interest in doing in foreign direct investment and exports. Trust, therefore, not only increases the UK standing in the world, but also paves the way for a more prosperous Britain. So, what makes people trust the UK? Often cited are the UK's strengths in its higher education system and cultural institutions. In particular, participation in cultural activities with the UK is associated with a 10-point increase in trust, be that through experiencing UK arts, culture or education, learning the English language, or benefiting from UK expertise in sports, science or civil society projects. In general, the UK's people and institutions are and continue to be widely trusted. But it cannot be afford to be complacent. This is why the UK should focus on strengthening cultural and educational ties with other countries if it aims to maintain and strengthen its relationships on the world stage. Thank you. Thank you. A further contribution from the floor. That's all, thank you. Okay, it's Vincenzo Sinaguglia, a Manchester Metropolitan University graduate. Lord Speaker, let's continue talking about Brexit. I would like to introduce an aspect of this debate which has been largely overlooked or not deemed relevant in government negotiations in Brussels regarding our future outside the European Union. Now, this concerns the importance of young adults' views on which direction the nation should take, be it a hard or soft Brexit approach. Now, as the next generation of leaders of this country, it is paramount that our collective ideas are listened to and considered by the Brexit Secretary and his team with absolute respect, because, to be perfectly frank, it is the present leaders of this country 
It is them that in effect are custodians of our future. A future which hangs in the balance on a wide range of major issues relating to young adults, from the impact of Brexit on the student population to attracting the finest young brains and skilled blue collar workers from around Europe, as we have been for many years. It is these young people that have proved the solid bedrock of the multi-skilled and talented workforce that the UK can pride itself in having today. It is this ability for us as a united nation, uh, one that is inclusive of the opinions of all in a famously democratic society to include the voice of young adults amongst all of us, that truly makes us the global leader. As the individuals whom will live and work within a UK outside the European Union, we are the next generation that will have to deal with its repercussions, negotiating a different looking jobs landscape. Thank you. Many thanks. Uh, a further contribution from the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, good afternoon, Lords and fellow debaters. Um, my name is Sarah Barno and I'm representing Newham Sixth Form College. And I will be speaking in favour of the first motion, which is the UK having, um, like, closely working with the Commonwealth and global partners to <coughs> achieve common regional aims. It is impractical for Britain to seclude itself from foreign countries. The UK is part of strategic alliances around the world, such as NATO, and giving up these connections would pose a great threat to both the British economy and the security of its citizens. Britain has a long-standing history of intervention around the world, most notably its empire, which controlled large portions of the world for many years. Because of this, the UK has treaties and agreements with its former colonies called the Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth countries support each other, and Britain is the most important of these. They support uh, countries um, by purchasing from them, for example, bananas from the Caribbean. And the livelihoods of these small producers are highly dependent on continued trade with the UK. Stopping this would be disastrous for many of the Commonwealth countries and would also reduce the British economic growth. The world is becoming even more globalised. Trade between countries is increasing. Isolation is not, the is not the correct approach we should take. Taking into account that we will be leaving the EU, trade is more important than ever. So we need these foreign relations to keep the security of the British citizens and the British economy strong. So let us not distance ourselves. Thank you. Many thanks. Um, I'd now like to call on uh, Kathleen Lacey uh, to speak for Perspective One. Sadly, she isn't uh, uh, with us. So let us move on uh, to another view, perhaps from the floor. Thank you, Lord Speaker. My name is Lucy Boardman, and I'm here as a guest of the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association. International relations is all about the way in which countries and non state actors interact with each other on a global level. As the world is becoming increasingly more globalised, countries are having to cooperate with each other more and more. And as such, it is vital that the UK does not choose to isolate itself from the international community. Worldwide issues such as global poverty and climate change cannot be tackled alone, and domestic issues relating to trade, the economy, security and social affairs are undoubtedly linked to those of other nations which is why the UK should be aiming to work with the Commonwealth, European countries, the EU and global partners to achieve common goals. We must not forget about our independence as a country, but instead of making unilateral decisions, regular, open and transparent dialogue is needed to ensure productive collaboration between states. This is how the UK <coughs> can support and contribute to international relations in the 21st century and help to produce well thought out productive policies that work towards common regional aims and a safer future. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, another view from the uh, floor, uh, the back. Thank you, Lord Speaker. I'm Rohit Mukhapati and I'm from Queen Mary's Grammar School. Ladies and gentlemen, you may be aware that Philip Hammond, sorry, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, recently released his budget. And a popular newspaper described his policies as unobjectionable, but also weak. 
but that's not the Chancellor's fault. Britain has fallen through the ranks from the fifth to the sixth strongest economy in the world. The standards of living, of living are stagnating, and wages haven't risen since the financial crisis in 2008. Our forecast for productivity, a main factor in not only our current um, economy but future economy, has been set at a much lower rate than previously forecasted. And even that is optimistic. It does not even consider the fact that net migration may fall due to Brexit and we may even encounter a no-deal Brexit, which is still possible. We are currently in a weak and vulnerable position, not only economically, but also politically. For the first time since it was established in 1941, the International Court of Justice does not have a British judge on its uh, ranks. This is concerning for a nation which claims to be a global power and influence. And our politics at home are also, also face many problems. Although it's not as prominent in the UK as it is in the USA, many of our policies, or we can see a rise in populist policies. And on that note, I would like to refer to a point made by an earlier speaker. In order to help other nations in, around the world, Britain first, must, first, but first, sorry, must first seek to become strong and united. Thank you. Again, many thanks. I'd now like to call on Chloe Chook to argue for perspective two. Lord Speaker, fellow debaters, I'm Chloe Chuck and I'm from Diaston School. We, as a privileged country, wealthy both in terms of money and expertise, should aim to be a global leader. Countries less advantaged than ourselves need a confident, capable leader to point them in the direction of change, and we could be the catalyst of that change. Undoubtedly, we are a nation revelling in a wonderfully diverse heterogeneity of talent. We have world-renowned mathematicians, doctors and writers. We have had, do have and will have people who are single-handedly capable of altering the way we see, think and create. With such capacity <coughs> and potential, would it not profit us all if we shared our talent? We should be the world's pioneering leaders. From our world-class knowledge and prowess, diseases that wipe out millions in third world countries could be eradicated. Innocent lives could be saved merely by showing a bit of compassion. In 2014, the NHS was declared the best healthcare system by a panel of experts that rated its care superior to that of countries who spend far more on health. In the USA, for example, babies are born already in debt. The delivery itself, itself can cost upwards of $10,000. Compare that to the UK, where prenatal birth and postnatal care are all free. Having a family member die simply because they couldn't afford a procedure is unimaginable to someone who is, has lived in the UK their entire life. But this is the harsh reality for millions around the globe. It's so easy to ignore when it isn't your child, your mother, your grandparent. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chloe, for that contribution. Over here, yes. Thank you, Lord Speaker. My name is Jay Porter and I'm a Stonewall Young campaigner. I'm also a local councillor in North Staffordshire. Our United Kingdom has a proud recent history on human rights issues. I believe that LGBT issues are human rights issues. I believe that this is a priority that we need to push forward as we leave the European Union. In the 50 years since Homosexuality was partly decriminalised. Obviously, this year it's the 50th anniversary, which we've been celebrating. Britain has become a more modern, inclusive and tolerant country. We've had same-sex marriage recently. Gay and bisexual men are now able to donate blood. And homophobic bullying is finally being prioritised thanks to the work of our current Education Secretary, who has really pushed this forward. However, this is not the case across the entire Commonwealth. 
In fact, 36 out of the 52 Commonwealth nations, homosexuality is still illegal. And that's shocking, that is. In some of those countries, you can even be given the death penalty for being a gay man like I am. So if I went to Nigeria, for instance, in some parts of Nigeria, I would be given the death penalty for any homosexual acts, even though it's my right to choose who I love. As we leave the European Union and we become a more global Britain, we should aim to reach out to the world. We should aim to come out for LGBT people. We, when we form trade deals with these countries, we should raise human rights issues like the ones I'm talking about, and we should make it a priority. So let's come out for LGBT. Let's make the world a more loving and accepting place for all, regardless of who we choose to love. Thank you. <clears throat> Many thanks for that contribution. I would now like to call upon Parvan Deep Joe San to argue for Perspective 3. Lord Speaker, we have heard many impassioned arguments from all sides of this debate. However, whilst much has been made of our economic power, indeed my, my honourable friend mentioned that we are the fifth largest economy in the world, this economic growth and expansion is founded upon the actions of multinational firms with profits that leave our borders. We are no global economic leader. We are merely a marketplace where the biggest firms in the world come to trade. Just look at the inflation of house prices and property prices, in London especially, but also in the country as a whole. The next generation will be called Generation Rent for a reason. They will never be able to own their own homes. It will become a dream that is unattainable and unachievable. Food bank uses too has increased by 40% over the last five years. And this, Lord Speaker, is the greatest betrayal of all. We are no global military leader too. Our huge military budget has not stopped us from getting involved and stuck in the quagmire of Iraq or Afghanistan leading to the loss of British lives in a country that has no connection to us with people that have nothing to do with us. Now imagine if this money was spent on our own problems, because the crux of this argument is the state of our own public services and the fact that food bank usage has, in, has increased by 40% in the last five years. Given these severe problems at home, shouldn't we focus on our own problems first rather than try to take a position of global leadership we no longer possess? The days of our empire are long gone. Let us not pretend that they still exist. Thank you. <clears throat> Many thanks. I'd now like to call on Pierce Robinson to contribute to this debate. Lord Speaker. Lord Speaker, fellow debaters, the United Kingdom is at an inflection point in its history. Strategic foresight and global alliance building will be critical to maintaining its position as a global agenda setter and the pillar of the liberal international architecture. As Brexit negotiations continue, Britain must look to the future beyond Europe, to its most steadfast alliance, the Commonwealth. The chair of this House's International Relations Committee said the hope for democracy, good government, the rule of law, and the projection of our values through soft power is increasingly going to have to be through the rest of the English-speaking world, in other words, the Commonwealth. And his point is well taken. The Commonwealth represents 52 nations scattered strategically across the world, of which 52 nations represent 2.4 billion people who represent one third of the world's population. This means that the Commonwealth can become what the EU has not, a bulwark against the rise of illiberal organizations, state-run capitalism, and a truly global alliance bold in its advocacy for democracy and universal rights. The Commonwealth as a strategic central alliance renewed relationship with the EU 
is essential for Britain's foreign policy position going forward to achieve common global and regional objectives. And that, my Lord, is why I encourage this Honourable House to join me and stand in support of Perspective One. I thank you. Thank you. Another view from the floor. Thank you, Lord Speaker. Hi, I'm Catherine Woolley. I'm representing the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association headquarters. I would just like to address two of the main issues raised here. Firstly, how are we meant to give foreign aid whilst also looking after our own country domestically? But also, secondly, should we give foreign aid? So, I'd like to say that domestically, if we want to see the continuation of the NHS, if, if us as a generation want to see ourselves looked after into our old age, we need economic growth and restructuring. The NHS isn't sustainable how it is at the moment. If we want to see the reduction of homelessness, if we want to see the reduction of unemployment, we need economic growth and restructuring. If we are to give foreign aid, we also need to look at that. It's only 0.7%. That is pitiful. That is the crumb of the cake we indulge in. Of that 0.7%, only 17% in 2015 went to humanitarian aid. That means only 17% went to looking after people. The rest was given to the UN and other states. We need to restructure this and look at what we're doing because that 0.7% could be used so much better and could help so many more people. The people we help through foreign aid are the trading partners of the future. We can't turn in on ourselves if we can't seek to be a leader because that inflates our own self-worth. We need to look out and better ourselves through international respect. And this is why I support perspective number one. Thank you. Thank you. I'd now like to call on Lewis Longman uh, to speak for Perspective One. Thank you, Lord Speaker. <clears throat> uh, my name is Lewis Longman. I'm from Archbishop Beck uh, Catholic College, Liverpool. Um, our great nation is built upon the foundations of trade, cooperation and liberty, always remaining at the head of world humanitarian and diplomatic efforts, a leader, a guardian of basic human liberties, a true force of freedom spreading values of democracy and fair governance. Britain stands as a bastion to all nations. However, we are at a pivotal moment in the development of the world political stage. As an international community, we must stand steadfast against <clears throat> ideological shifts such as the rising tide of populism and xenophobic far-right views that challenge our modern progressive values. The rampant breeding ground of hate our poorest communities have become has resulted in the upheaval of the world political landscape. More and more we see extreme views becoming mainstream party rhetoric, normalising these views across Europe and beyond. <coughs> Sorry. This cannot continue. As a nation, we must stand and fight through peace, trade and understanding, working with our international partners to achieve our goal of truly, a truly free and equal world, working to improve the situations of our vast numbers of people that have flocked to the ideological extremes. As our Prime Minister said, these are challenging times. But I am confident that a global Britain has the ability and indeed the responsibility to rise to the moment and, step, and so let us step up to the task and let us do so together with the confidence and conviction of a truly global Britain. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another view from the floor. Yes. Uh, I'm Patrick Green from Cardinal Wiseman School and also a member of the Cooperative Party. And cooperation is a topic which I'd like to discuss. For centuries, the great European powers were fighting. But now, thanks to the advent of the European Union, it's laughable to think that France, Germany and Spain would ever go to war to each other again. Instead, trading was considered the best way to develop the prosperity of our country. <coughs> the misery of, re of war has not been repeated on these shores since the European Union was founded. 
cooperation has helped this country greatly, and we should all unite against the greater threats to this world. All countries should unite against the terrorist threat which threatens to ruin our way of living and against climate change which could ruin the very planet. If we cooperate, we can achieve these goals. If we cooperate, we can defeat these threats. But if not, we will continue squabbling while these threats will continue to invade on our privacy, our rights and our nation. And now Andrew McNeil to argue for Perspective 2. Andrew? Good afternoon, Lord Speaker, fellow debaters. The country has voted. It is clear to see that we are not OK with our once prominent voice being down, drowned out by the sheer multitude of other countries in the EU, which were not allowing us to flourish independently not allowing us to lead, as we many times have before. Now is our chance, our chance to grasp the opportunity to reinstate ourselves as the global leader we can be, and that we once were, to develop our already redeeming qualities like education. However, I believe this does not have to mean self-segregation. Taking us off the playground that we shaped with other global leaders like Canada, Germany and France completely seems counterproductive. Complete isolation is not the best route to take. We need to strike a balance. A confident and, con and collected country that has the ability to work closely with other countries when needed to, like on global issues such as the environment, but also one that is not thrust thrusted into situations like an economical crisis that we do not want to be in is the best way for us to become global leaders. Thank you. Now, if you, um, lady right at the end on this second row. Lord Speaker, fellow debaters, my name is Hannah Graham and I'm a guest of the Royal Commonwealth Society. Um, the UK should absolutely aim to work closely with the Commonwealth, European countries, the EU and global partners. Individually, we are but one drop. Together, we are an ocean. Despite the environment actually meaning the air that we breathe, the water that we drink and the food that we eat, it's really not talked enough in British politics. Climate change is the poster child for global di diplomacy today. In fact, it can easily be re regarded as the most complex global policy disaster of our lifetime. Climate change is global in both its cause and its effect dimensions. 2016 was the hottest year on record, and the target is set in the Paris Agreement will be breached within just a few years if we don't hurry up. 40,000 premature deaths a year are attributed to air pollution in the UK. Our wildlife and nature are in crisis too. 60% of UK species are in long-term decline, while 15% are at risk of extinction. And I shouldn't have to mention the thousands of innocent people who lose their lives and homes every day due to climate-related disasters. The main creators of climate change are the rich, predominantly white, industrial countries of the Western world. We suffer the least, while the poorer, predominantly black and minority ethnic origin countries of the Global South suffer the most, while contributing least to the problem. How is this fair? Climate change really is a collective action problem, and there should be a built-in compulsion for addressing the root causes through international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Isabel Younane. Lord Speaker. <laughs> Lord Speaker, fellow debaters. The UK has pledged to embrace the world and seek to build a global, outward-looking Britain that is confident on the world stage. We have sought to be a leader to strengthen international connections and forge new trade agreements. <laughs> But I think the phrase global leader begs, begs the simple question, what does it mean to lead? We are a nation that comprises less than 1% of the world's population. Militarily, we are outperformed by global heavyweights such as the US, China, Russia, and India. 
This is why we asked 11,000 aspiring young leaders the question, what does good leadership mean to you? Despite hailing from 11 different countries with vastly different systems of governance, we found the same priorities for leadership, collaboration and teamwork. Bringing people in rather than locking them out, bridging divides rather than building walls. The traditional military metaphor of leadership is beginning to look a bit outdated. We see this in real life as well. You're usually likely to have more friends if you can attract people with your wit, with your humour and sincerity, by the things you have in common, by your shared values. This is how cultural relations works. It helps create the trust that is essential for realising a state's international objectives. In the words of a famous life coach, it helps us to win friends and influence people. Mutuality is the defining element. It is a two-way process that can be student-teacher relationship in a language class, for example. And these mutually beneficial and long-lasting connections are a vital aspect of the UK's national reputation. As a global cultural leader, the UK can main maintain a position of influence. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now a view from the floor. Um, let's go down here. Yes, sir. Lord Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, fellow debaters. My name is Jared Grant and I'm from Broxburn Academy. I feel that to firstly, for my contribution to the debate, we must first acknowledge where the UK sits on the ladder of global power and influence. We do not sit at the top anymore. Soaring above us are powerhouses like the United States and China. To further illustrate my point about just how powerful the United States is, in the United Nations, if the US does not back a plan, the plan fails. They are a global leader. We are not the US. We do not have that power, nor is it tangible that in our current state will we ever have that power. And that is why I feel that we shouldn't be a global leader and why that we should work with the EU and other global partners to try and establish uh, tangible methods to achieve these uh, common regional aims, such as helping poverty in the third world and helping poverty in Europe as a whole. I feel that we, I feel that, sorry, I feel that there are these issues, we cannot isolate ourselves and say we must focus on only our country. That is m much akin to, uh, due to our past of colonialism and other such matters that we have been invested in. We have caused various amounts of these issues. We cannot shove someone in the dirt and then say, well, we still need to work on ourselves. I thank you for listening. And now Caleb uh, Davidson. Thank you, Lord Speaker, fellow debaters. My name is Caleb Davidson, and I'm from Broxburn Academy. So, using teamwork and climate change have been discussed a lot during this debate, and I feel there are a few inherent problems with the views of perspectives one and two. With regard to perspective one, well, one does not simply solve the world's problems. Let's take the example of the Paris Agreement. This is a very relevant recent instance in which the UK has worked closely with other countries from around the globe to try and achieve not only a regional aim, but a global aim. This teamwork is wonderful in theory, but quite frankly, it hasn't achieved anything at all. In fact, we're still producing a large quantity of carbon emissions, and we're on track to actually produce a greater quantity than we were before the agreement was signed. Now, concerning perspective two, once again using the Paris Agreement as an example, we can see that global leaders don't really have much influence over anyone. The US, one of the world's leaderiest leaders, recently pulled out of the agreement, and they have been condemned for it. No other country has followed suit, and in fact, even their own people don't agree with the decision. If a global leader like America holds such little sway over other countries, what hope does the UK have to influence anyone if we were to seek this leadership position? What's more, is it even possible for one country to be a global leader in this context? Look at China. They're a global leader turned babysitter to North Korea. But they have no power here, at least in this instance. They cannot stop North Korea throwing their toys out of the pram. But the issue is that the toys are missiles. 
and the pram is right next to South Korea and Japan. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Now I'm going to go to the crossbenchers there because we, we, you've all been rather um, ignored up to now. So, lady there, who's yes? Thank you. Thank you, Lord Speaker. My name is Amy McInerney, and I'm from Archbishop Beck College in Liverpool. Now, I'm arguing against the point of global leadership. When we think of global leaders, we can always assume that we think of the United States of America. Now, from the picturesque view, we see a, a nation built, rich, powerful. But look behind that mask and that facade, and you will see a nation built on the oppression of other minorities. Is it morally right to truly be a global leader when we as people have a history similar to those? The President of the United States of America, who is ignorant and neglectful to its own history, is sitting in a house built by slaves that they stole from their countries. <coughs> Sorry. Should we truly neglect our own history? Should we truly be a global leader when we as people already have hate crimes happening in our own streets? Should we be a model example for other um, less countries who are less economically developed as such when there are still people who are being hated and killed for their religion or their race or their sexuality, for example? Should we or should we sort it? We, we already have a culture which has intervened with oppression. We think, I think we should sort it before we become a global leader. As we say, we may have things like the NHS, which is free, but until our ideology meets our technology, only then can we truly be a global leader. Lord, as a really clever mind once said, we are living in space, space age times with stone age minds. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Max Earnshaw arguing for perspective one. Thank you, Lord Speaker, fellow debaters. I'm Max Earnshaw and I'm from Whitley Bay High School in Tyneside. We are at a crossroads. Where do we go after Brexit? The sensible, the logical and the correct thing for us to do is to engage with countries that we share regional matters with, a close history with and a deal of moral influence over, from Europe and from the Commonwealth. This is the start of the path that will lead us to prosperity. What we must not do is transition into isolationism. <laughs> Isolationism is a method of governing which is historically anti-trade and anti-immigration. With fewer immigrants, we could see an increase in hate crimes as the percentage of people with foreign heritage in the UK decreases. This will give rise to people with intolerant views to spread them. Socially, it is imperative that we move forwards, not backwards. Furthermore, a key feature of any isolationist regime is import tariffs. This would ostracise international partners and the economy would begin to crumble. America's so-called patriotism has just this week led to the President sharing unverified and xenophobic content from a vile organisation on social media. This just goes to show how uncontrolled nationalism can very easily become radical, hate-filled, chauvinistic jingoism. Blame and hate campaigns will, inevitably, as always happens throughout history, take it out on vulnerable people with their divisive messages. This would damage our quality of life and it would set our country back. How can we ever justify this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, right at the end on the front row. Thank you, Lord Speaker. My name is Michael Yip and I'm from the Royal Commonwealth Society. Many of my fellow debaters today have spoken in favour of Motion 2, which is that the UK should be a global leader. To them, I offer a cautionary warning. Ought implies can, which is to say that if we should be a global leader, we must have the means to do so too. In some areas, this is possible, for example, in healthcare, in education, in technology, professional services, and so on. But in others, not so much. For example, in our military interventions of North Africa and the Middle East. We should never lose sight of this. My second point is that in the areas where we choose to be a leader, we must not fixate on the sharing, the exporting or the disseminating. Being a leader is also about learning from, encouraging, inviting the best from 
the other countries around the world who may not share the same historical, economic or political clout as we do. In sum, to be a leader is to be humble. We shouldn't lose sight of that either. Thank you. Uh, Cara, Cara Moran, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Lord Speaker. My name is Cara Moran and I am from Holy Family Catholic School. The UK should be a global leader as we are a significant performer on today's global stage and we have a vital opportunity to showcase the strengths of the UK. Globally, eyes are on us to see whether we can cope with Brexit. Instead of coping and surviving, we should strive to be a prosperous country. Our membership with the EU has always been complicated, but now we are leaving, we have the opportunity to set our own agenda. For example, something that is very important to me is that we are the second largest development donor in the world, and we have an even greater chance to be pragmatic, to push human rights as well as our conflict resolution agenda. Brexit will give the UK the opportunity to have its own free trade policy with the rest of the world without the unnecessary burden of the single market. While many fear globalisation, the PM herself has said that the answer cannot be to retreat, to turn to protectionism or to abandon free trade. I agree and believe instead countries should work harder to ensure that everyone, including developing countries, utilise the opportunities given by Brexit. Britain, with a unique history, culture, networks, reinforced by a strong economy, can now have a new and truly international identity. As opposed to dwelling on whether we will leave or remain, we should deal with the issues at hand, grasp opportunities with both hands, and truly prosper. Thank you. Another view from the uh, floor. Um, let me go right at the back over there. Um, I'd like to, uh, my name is William Burley from Queen Mary's Grammar School. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to argue that we must work strongly with the Commonwealth to uh, project our values that have been, um, from the, from the uh, start of the Commonwealth, we've projected democracy, human rights, we've promoted these values, and, and even today we must still um, continue to promote these because there is so much going on in the world that we cannot ignore ethnic cleansing and, and the, the, the crises in Europe, the migrant crises. We, ca we cannot selfishly ignore these in favour of strengthening our own wealth, despite there are many problems in our country, but we cannot. We have a moral obligation to the world to um, project these values and to give foreign aid and to work with the Commonwealth to, um, you know, against Donald Trump sharing... Um, against uh, the, um, the President of, the America, of America um, promoting popularism across the world, not just there, all over the world, and we must um, share these values with the rest of the world, because if we don't, who will? Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Emma Bailey, please. Lord Speaker, fellow debaters, in case of an in-flight emergency, please make sure all personal safety measures are carried out before assisting others. This surely should be the case for our own country. In 2015, the United Kingdom spent £12.1 billion on foreign aid. In June the following year, following the Brexit referendum, our country's economic position plummeted to its lowest point in 30 years. Just imagine how we could have spent this £12.1 billion. Recently, the Chief Executive of the National Health Service delivered a speech citing the Leave campaign's pledge of £350 million more a week to be spent solely on the NHS. The situation faced by the jewel of the British social fabric is appalling and our government should be doing all they can to preserve the fragile beacon of our nation. We are clearly a country in crisis, so why on earth should we focus our attention on the rest of the world's affairs? It is paramount that we, as a country, should unify and protect the heart of this fine state. I am certain that you would all agree with me in the fact that the foundations of our own country should be our main priority. 
And as a famous doctor once said, help yourself before you consider helping others. You cannot give anything to anybody without having something to give. Thank you. Okay. Right. Um, I, I'll try and get... I'm not going to get everybody in, but I'll do my best. Um, the person there um, on the end... Yes. No, this way. This way. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Solomon Elliott. I'm from Whitley Bay High School. And I'd like to say that contrary to the wishes of many of the MPs that have sat in these chairs and the Houses and the Commons, we do not live in a time of strength and stability. We live in a time of change and great disorder. Um, I'll use the example of Brexit and mass migration that's going on in Europe now. More than ever, the Christian world and the Muslim world are clashing. Sorry, I'm just trying to clarify my point. The Christian world are clashing. To, to, for these cultures to get along together, Britain needs to assimilate with these people because free movement allow, will allow a certain conflict that we can't, we can't um, control just through EU regulations. We need to control immigration in order for us to solve the completely contradictory values of these two cultures. Um, by doing this, we act as, a, as an example of a leader to the rest of the world, because instead of just pushing it away and not helping these people, we should come together, take the best from each of each other's cultures, and accept and try and help others. We cannot do this by just simply accepting other cultures. We need to cooperate. Thank you very much. And now, Amelia Boudretti. There we are. Lord Speaker, fellow debaters, ladies and gentlemen, as an American senator recently said, we are stronger together. If we take a look at back through history, we can see that the only way we got through the atrocities and horrors of World War II was through international cooperation. The darkest time in the history of our world was combated by unity. This is why we need to use the UN and the EU to embrace unity and not turn our backs on peace and stability. If we don't learn from history, we are doomed to repeat the mistakes of our past. In the last 24 hours alone, I have worn clothes from Indonesia, watched movies filmed in America, eaten food originating from Italy, used a phone manufactured in China, and boarded a plane whose parts were made in Japan. So why on earth should the UK not continue their partnership with the countries of our world in order to maintain these basic yet essential, in essential ingredients that make our lives richer? As the world progresses, we are globally interdependent and we need all of our nations to continue to communicate. We do not need politicians to breed exclusion and racism, especially not in today's progressive society. Multinationalism is something UK citizens are proud of. And as Albus Dumbledore said, once said, we are only as strong as we are united. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, um, uh, um, I think, yes, here. Thank you, Lord Speaker. My name is Royce Anna Omsuri, and I'm speaking representing Holy Family Catholic School. I believe that the UK <coughs> should strive to become a global leader without having an apathetic perspective on the matter of international relations. Although some attempts to aid neighbouring and foreign countries have been in vain, neglecting to avoid various other countries economically, socially and environmentally <coughs> causes us to be perceived as concom concomitant salients with the cause of depravity. Choosing to contribute to the betterment of deprived countries, we'll, we are able to juxtapose history into a more 
diverse geographically, I mean, in a more diverse, sorry, in a more diverse geographical angle, whilst becoming prevalent examples of a leading country. Conclusively, I think that we should aim to acknowledge depravity to the best of our reasonable capability globally, as we as a country are deprived and although my motion proposes we assist others, we must consider that we as a country are more sustained in most aspects compared to various regions of our international community. By becoming the improved historic version of our country, we are able to be an exemplary model to other various countries and regions of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you very much indeed. Um, and now, Lewis Fraser. Thank you, Lord Speaker. My fellow debaters, the 20th century may have seen the sun finally set on the British Empire, but the 21st has seen a new dawn for the UK as a modern global pioneer. This is not so much a question of aiming to become a global leader, but recognising and consolidating the influence that we already wield on the world stage. Having the world's sixth largest economy, for instance, is far from the realms of simply aiming for isolationism or regional goals. In the ways that the United States are revered for their military power, the UK is respected for our soft power and diplomacy that spans the globe. The close friendships we have fostered, not just with the 52 Commonwealth states and their 2.3 billion residents, but across the world, make us an esteemed diplomatic presence and role model to both developing and developed countries alike. A former PM, for example, actively led the global response to the financial crisis and the 2005 third world debt relief effort, with, even ahead of the United States. The 21st century is a fantastic opportunity for the UK to complete our transition into a leading global pioneer, capitalising on our current geopolitical influence and never underestimating the potential we have. Without the shackles of the European Union, we'll be able to expand our outlook even further across the world to countries that may have been sacrificed in favour of the European Union. We should be confident at the negotiating table, knowing that the respect that we have across the world means we do not need the European Union to be a global leader. Thank you very much. OK, now we're... <clears throat> let's have the gentleman now. Thank you, uh, Lord Speaker. Uh, my name is Sam Whitehouse and I'm from Coventry University and I raise in favour of Motion 1. Um, last Saturday was International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, uh, a cause in which the UK government strongly support for its 2016 Women and Girls Strategy. This is just one area in which the UK can strive to achieve through cooperation with our European allies and Commonwealth family. No longer does the UK dominate and dictate global affairs, but nor should we turn our back on global injustices. The creation of international institutions such as the Commonwealth serve as a platform for dialogue and the need to build consensus. If the UK government is seriously committed to ending violence against women, then I suggest it does so by raising the issue at next year's Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in London, chaired by the PM herself. For the Commonwealth is an organisation of 52, of 52 nations, spanning six continents, a population, half of whom are under 25. A key demographic are those uh, are um, a key uh, a demographic in which are um, uh, the most likely victims of gender-based violence. Therefore, I raise in favour of motion one. Thank you. Now, another view. Uh, you're one of the ladies here. Go on. <laughs> you go ahead. Um, I'm Anna Louise Layden, and I'm an Associate Fellow of the Royal Commonwealth Society. It's very clear to me, listening today, that we live in an, in an unstable UK. But we live in an unstable world as well. 
And that's been clear through all my fellow debaters. Thank you, Lord Speaker and the Lords. Um, one thing that is clear in my head when I think about this is it's almost like we're in a playground. We're in a playground of countries all fighting to have that little bit of their playground and that little bit of their world. Have you think back to being in that playground yourself, being in that primary school playground where you are fighting to have friends, but you're lonely. If you, from here in the thing, we are in, unstable. This playground is unstable. What I want to put forward and want to say is think of being that individual that is trying to make way in, in that playground. Listening to the UK, should we become global leaders? Should we fight our own problems? Should we think, actually, I think the only way to make friends and to become part of that established playground is by working together with everyone else, by listening to other people, by listening to other people's thoughts from wherever they are in that playground and learning to play and communicate together. And that's what I want to bring forward and why I'm supporting Motion One. And I regret the last uh, speech from the floor. Well, as I've missed out the crossbenches almost entirely, I will take the gentleman there. Good. Thank you, Lord Speaker. I am James Morrie from Archbishop Beck Catholic Sports College in Liverpool. I would like to start with a quote by a great author. Some men are more equal than others. Is this true? Well, some people seem to think so. For if you say that the problems of people in Britain deserve precedence over the problems of people in other countries, you inherently imply that the people of Great Britain are more important than people of other countries. And, well, in a society where we want everyone to be equal, even implying this should be appalling. And so, the UK should aim to be a global leader in foreign aid, in helping other people, if in nothing else because this is something truly good, something we can all be, a proud, be proud of, and this would be something that would make Britain truly great in helping other people who cannot help themselves. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for everyone who's uh, uh, spoken. Um, it, you, you run like uh, uh, an express train, and you come in absolutely on time, which is uh, something, again, that we're not totally used to uh, in the House of Lords. But thank you all very much for your contributions. Uh, and apologies for those who weren't called. I'm afraid those of us like uh, Lord Howell and, uh, and, and others who are here uh, will remember that in the uh, House of Commons, it is quite common to actually have a speech that you wish to make you wish to make it really forcefully and you're never called to actually make it at all. But you will find that there are other occasions when you can make it. Uh, that at any rate is uh, uh, our experience. So we now move on to the closing speeches, which are uh, to be again a maximum of three minutes per speaker. Uh, Christine again will be on bell ringing uh, duty. Once I've called on each speak speaker, do please clap just as you have before. And I'd now like to call upon Harrison Worley to summarise the case for Perspective One. The United Kingdom should aim to work closely with the Commonwealth, European countries, the European Union and global partners to achieve common regional aims. Lord Speaker, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Harrison Worley from Queen Mary's Grammar School. I'm aware that we're all quite tired, so I'll keep this short. We have heard throughout the debate today just how many problems the world has. Climate change, rapid population growth, terrorism. Each of these are problems that we cannot solve on our own. It has been stated in the debate today that we are a global leader. I ask you this. Would a global leader succumb to the demands of European countries in, I'm sorry to mention it, the Brexit negotiations? The prime and current example being the outrageous divorce bill, which we are being, which we are being forced to pay, rumoured to now be around £50 billion. However, despite not being a world superpower and not being able to compete with countries such as the USA, 
in terms of economic prowess and military might, we do foster extremely good relationships with these world superpowers and other countries around the world. Relationships which we have built up for the previous two centuries and which we can now take advantage of. An example of this is China. The growing NIC had its leader come to this very building just two years ago. We can grow these new and existing relationships to allow us to create new trade partnerships which would allow us to build our economy and strengthen, strengthen our country. It makes little sense to now adopt isolationist policies, much as America is starting to do, and cut ourselves off from the countries which we already have links with, when in fact it makes logical sense to instead use these links to our advantage in a way we previously couldn't due to being constrained by EU regulations. Let us work together with countries we already have links with to not only make the world a better place, but to make our country better as well. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to call upon Usman Ali to summarise the case for Perspective 2, the UK should aim to be a global leader. Lord, <laughs> Lord Speaker, Lords, Ladies and Gentlemen, Usman Ali, Associate Fellow of the Royal Commonwealth Society and Scotland's first Queen's Young Leader. The United Kingdom should be a global leader. That is what we have all debated here today. So let us all now seek mutual agreement across the Chamber to make our great nation the global leader that others look to in good times and bad and a leading nation that, that we can all be proud of. Global leader, what does that mean and what it does not? Well, it does not mean absolute isolation from others in the world, but nor does it mean having complete control over everything that happens. Instead, being a global leader is about achieving a fine balance. And in doing so, we, the United Kingdom, must stand resolute to defend our values and what we believe in. But it too must mean that we have to work together with other states and non-governmental organisations to achieve common goals or resolve common challenges. Lord Speaker, surely by working with others to achieve greater impact is what the United Kingdom believes in and what being a global leader is about. By taking this approach, we are not protecting but enhancing our national interest. For Lord Speaker, having the United Kingdom be a global leader is our national interest. Now, I'd like to uh, turn to the substantial points made in the course of this debate. We heard from the introductory speakers who talked about our values, such as the rule of law and the Westminster model, which underpins so many parliamentary democracies across our world. We heard about our brilliant NHS and we've also heard about the foreign impact that we are making in terms of our AIDS budget and peacekeeping missions across the globe. But let me also turn to some of the issues raised by those who spoke in the debate from the floor. Let's be honest, Brit the United Kingdom has made mistakes in the past, but this generation, the next generation, can lead the development of a new vision. We are leaders today and not just tomorrow. Our time is now, so let's take that time and deliver that new vision. Let's be outward looking, as well as looking at what kind of society and country we want to be. If we care for food banks in Edinburgh, Belfast, Cardiff and London, then why should we not care about the food banks in Paris, Beirut, Nairobi and Delhi? What kind of world would we be living in if everybody across the globe just turned in on themselves and didn't care about anyone else. I agree that we should be looking after our own citizens too, so let's build an economic and socially progressive society and just society. Let's improve our public services and let's use opportunities such as Chogum and uh, the democratic will of leaving the European Union to look for opportunities to enhance trade and technology developments as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. And um, lastly, I'd like to call upon Sarah Gadala to summarise the case for Perspective 3. 
the United Kingdom should keep the affairs of other countries at a distance and focus on its own problems. Sarah. Thank you, Lord Speaker, fellow debaters. My name is Sara Gadalla, and I'm from the Aston School. While all the perspectives have had their fair share of valid arguments, such as moral obligation to the less fortunate and the oppressed, and the importance of international cooperation, they come mostly from a place of idealism rather than realism. The UK should not interfere into every conflict that goes on in the world. It's neither our right nor our responsibility to wade into the affairs of countries we have no ties to. This hardly ever brings about significant betterment for the world or ourselves, and just creates international enemies. We need to focus on our own problems within our own country before we often unnecessarily start trying to fix everyone else's problems. The first thing I would like to talk about is domestic investment. The UK is subject to terrorism attacks, is in financial deficit, has its own problems with poverty and homelessness, unemployment, substance abuse, tax avoidance from the super wealthy, and poor educational standards compared to other developed countries. In maths, the UK is ranked 27th in the world and in its lowest position since the year 2000. And in reading, we are ranked 22nd in the world. This is another thing that could be improved if funding wasn't so low. NHS social care and mental health systems are crumbling due to a lack of financial investment. Only when we have sorted our problems can we be a global leader. This will also give us a better position to help others in the future. The second thing I would like to talk about is why it's ineffective to intervene into the affairs of other countries. Often, foreign aid spending has been wasted or has contributed towards fraud and corruption. India and China, which receive millions of pounds of UK aid, have active space exploration programs. These countries need to learn to manage themselves instead of relying on wealthier countries for aid. They will never be truly self-sustaining unless we cut aid and force them to manage their budget in a more responsible way. It is unrealistic to think that aid to these countries will last forever. It simply isn't possible for them to climb out of their cycle of poverty without managing their budgets in a realistic and responsible way, which will be impossible if UK's foreign aid spending is there to stop them from ever being held accountable for the mismanagement of their country's budgets. Less than a tenth of Britain's 12 billion aid budget goes into humanitarian or emergency aid. Most British aid is actually development aid of dubious effectiveness too much of which goes to inefficient and wasteful multilateral organisations or gets paid directly into the treasuries of corrupt or incompetent governments. This is why the UK should keep the affairs of other countries at a distance and focus on its own problems. Only when we have sorted our own problems can we be a global leader. Thank you very much indeed. So, uh, I would like to first thank all the speakers, um, uh, everyone who's spoken today, either from the front benches or from around on the other benches, for what I think has been uh, an excellent debate and where I think all views have actually been uh, expressed and expressed extremely well. Uh, and again, I apologise for those many people who were excluded simply by uh, the confines of time as far as this debate um, is concerned. So we now move to the final vote and as before there will be three votes and as before you may vote only once and if you would please then raise your hand to do so so that the doorkeepers uh, can see you and can count uh, your vote clearly. So could you raise your hand if you believe that the United Kingdom should aim to work closely with the Commonwealth, European countries, the EU and global partners to achieve common regional aims.
Thank you very much, Simon. Right, and now, please, if you could raise your hands if you believe that the United Kingdom should aim to be a global leader. And lastly, uh, and finally, please raise your hands if you believe the UK should keep the affairs of other countries at a distance and focus on its own problems. for the result. Thank you very much indeed. So, uh, the uh, result um, is this. For vote one, there were 113 votes which is down nine uh, from the original vote before the debate, but 113. The vote, the second vote um, uh, for vote two um, was 43, and that was up six, that's global leader. And then the last one was uh, 21, and that was up nine, so 21 uh, votes there. So those are the... Uh, final results and I thank you very much uh, for those and it obviously shows that the debate had uh, some effect at any rate and some impact uh, upon your uh, uh, views and upon your votes. And before we bring these proceedings uh, to a entire end, I'd like to um, call on uh, the one or two of the Lords who have been here and we've been very, very distinguished today because we've got I mean, literally, the top of the House of Lords as far as international development um, is concerned. We have people uh, on this uh, front bench here um, with uh, enormous experience um, in the whole area of international development. And so first I'm going to call upon Lord Howell of Guildford. We've worked together for many years in, uh, uh, in the 1980s in Cabinet and he is now Chairman of the new International Relations Committee uh, in the House of Lords. David. Thank, uh, thank you. Thank you, Lord Speaker. Many positive speeches, uh, a marvellous emphasis which pleases me on the Commonwealth Network uh, and not too much on Brexit, which is a relief because we spent a great bit too much time on that. And of course, a very heavy emphasis from almost every speaker on the need to cooperate internationally. You can argue how you should do it, what procedures you should go through, but everyone is rightly saying to meet the colossal challenges of the world, we have to be part of the network. And I emphasize network because I'm a bit with those who say, we can't just walk out into the show and say, we're the boss, follow us, be the leader. We have to walk out and say, this is our example. This is what we've done in the past. This is what we can do by helping you. This is the way we can join the great networks of the future, which remember increasingly going to be dominated, not by Europe and the West, but increasingly by Asia and China and the rising powers of Asia, Africa and Latin America. That's a new world. The Commonwealth can help us enter that world, and I must say the speeches have been really wonderful in pointing, giving me the confidence that your generation understand that point, and if we work on it, we can do very great things in, from this country to help the world to move to greater stability and be a better place. Thank you very much.
And now, uh, Lord Collins of Highbury, he's the uh, opposition, Labour, spokesperson for international development and a great fellow campaigner for LGBT rights. Thank you. Thank you, Lord Speaker. I, I, I must admit, from the quality of this debate, I've never felt so intimidated, actually, in speaking in this chamber. You've been fantastic and enjoyable. And if you notice, we didn't fall asleep once, did we? So that just shows you uh, what a fantastic debate it's been. And can I just say that one of the things that struck me, and I'm sure it struck everyone in here, that the questions that you've uh, responded to today are not mutually exclusive. Of course, you know, global cooperation is part of our daily world, particularly if we want to succeed as an economy in terms of trade. And of course, one of the things that struck me uh, throughout, whatever question you focused on, you all had respect for your fellow human being. And that's, to me, the most important element of today's debate. And of course, you know, the ingredients of a thriving democracy are not limited to parliaments and parliamentarians. It's actually about civil society, churches, trade unions, they are often the groups that guarantee democracy and ensure human rights of everyone. So whatever you end up doing in the future, always remain engaged because the key to changing the world and what our development work is so specialist about is not about helping people, it's not about giving to people, it's actually about ensuring that we empower the powerless. Thank you. And now, uh, thirdly, uh, Baroness Sheehan, who is the Liberal Democrat uh, spokesman uh, for international development and also speaks with great experience. Thank you all very much, and can I add my congratulations to those of Lord Collins, to every single speaker who had the courage to stand up and speak with conviction. Um, I know at lunchtime when I was talking to one or two of you that um, uh, you, you, you were a little nervous because you were being asked to argue a position that you didn't hold yourself, and yet I could not spot which of you it was. You argued your position with such conviction. So well done. Congratulations indeed. Um, the debate today took me back two years when I made my maiden speech um, from the Liberal Democrat benches just across there. And my speech was made just after the Paris COP21 agreement, climate change agreement, uh, was made. And uh, it was something that was very close to my heart. And I know from a number of you, it was very close to your heart also. And the thrust of my speech was that um, climate change was so important because it was causing a lot of the problems that were leading to the refugee crisis that we were beginning to see then. We hadn't seen the full force of it. Alan Kurdi's little body hadn't been washed up in the beach in <coughs> Turkey at that point. And, uh, but it was very clear to me that climate change was contributing to the largest mass movement of people that we've seen in Europe since the Second World War. And um, so I'm, that took me back a few years. Um, it is, as so many of you said, it is so important that Britain stays in the global arena and shapes the response to global issues that don't respect borders such as immigration, refugee movements, terrorism, climate change and air pollution. And uh, thank you very much for bringing that to our attention again. And uh, lastly, we have uh, Lord Bates. Lord Bates is a government minister and therefore has his uh, hands on the levers of power. 
Uh, we think that at any rate, uh, is that right? <laughs> um, but, and he has an impeccable reputation uh, on uh, all sides of the House. He is the Minister of State for International Development, Lord Bates. Lord Speaker and, uh, and fellow speakers, um, I was struck uh, when Baron Sheeran was just speaking there about maiden speeches. And I wondered how many maiden speeches I was listening to today. How many in 10, 20, 30, 40 years' time, 50 years' time, if you're coming to the House of Lords, possibly even 60 years' time, we might actually hear again in this place. And I found it an absolutely inspiring time. I must admit I spent more time uh, taking notes of what you were saying than making notes of what I was supposed to say. So I'm not going to be uh, at long, but suffice to say this, that first of all, two things. Number one is I'm an optimist about the world. I actually believe the world is getting better. Uh, contrary to what you see in many places, the efforts that we're making to eliminate disease around the world, the increase in the number of people who are getting the opportunity of an education is incredible. Uh, the way that we're breaking down barriers, particularly on gender discrimination around the world, is, is amazing. The way that economic growth is going, a billion people lifted out of poverty so far this year. I think there are reasons to be optimistic uh, about the world as we face. The final thing I'd say to you is that in Parliament, in both houses, it's said there are only really two types of people who are here. There are those people who want to be here because they want to be something, and those people who want to be here because they want to do something. I hope amongst many of you, as you go back tonight, and you've had the enormous privilege, which very few people in this country have had, of actually being in the Mother of Parliaments, that you'll think to yourself, it's not so much about what I am, but how can I use this to actually advance the world to make it a better place and be the change we want to see. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. I think you show by your response how uh, much those words go home. I also think what David Howell said as well, that you can't instruct or lecture other nations, but what you can do is show by example uh, what you can do to change the world. But thank you um, all four. So the majority of you here today think that the United Kingdom should aim to work closely with the Commonwealth, European countries, the European Union and global partners to achieve common regional aims. And in spite of the uh, arguments put against it, it was carried with a, a majority that uh, all parties would be perfectly happy with to, uh, to, to arrive at at any election. Thank you so much for your uh, contributions and participation. You've done uh, a wonderful job and you should feel proud of yourselves and what you achieved today. And I'm, for one, I'm very impressed with the arguments and the way that you have put it. For those of you who've shared personal experiences, again, I thank you uh, for your honesty. I hope, above all, that you have enjoyed uh, today as uh, much as uh, we have and as much as I have. And it, uh, I should emphasize, a day like today could not happen without a great deal of work behind the scenes uh, from a great many people organising this event. Much is owed to the English-speaking Union staff, including Elliot Pallett and his team of mentors who have worked so hard in preparing today's speakers, as well as devising and delivering the debate model. And we also owe thanks to our other event partners, the British Council, the British Group of the International Parliamentary Union, the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, HQ, and the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, U UK, uh, the Commonwealth uh, Common Ties Network, and the Royal Commonwealth Society, who have all contributed uh, a great deal to the run-up to this um, uh, uh, event. Our thanks also go, uh, I can't see him at the moment, to the Yeoman Usher, Neil Bavistock, who supervised the security uh, for this event and made it possible to go ahead, 
Uh, to the second uh, principal doorkeeper, Mr Evans and his team, we thank you uh, for coming in on this non-sitting uh, Friday to ensure that today ran as smoothly as it did. Our thanks also to John Weiss and his Hansard team. Again, thank you very much for doing, uh, uh, doing the honours um, on this day, and we're very uh, grateful for that, and we look forward uh, to getting the splendid transcript that I know is coming uh, of this debate, and I'm sure we will all look forward to reading it. Thanks to uh, Ellen Large, Andrew Hickley, and all the members of the House of Lords staff who've worked so hard to make uh, today a success. But most of all, I would like to thank today's uh, participants, uh, those of you who've contributed speeches in the debate and those who attended to lend their support to friends, and the generally totally friendly atmosphere in which this debate uh, has taken place, uh, which is a, a lesson to us all. Without all of you, we would not have had a very important debate, and I'm really grateful for those who have taken the trouble and time uh, to journey here today uh, from, as you know, uh, really quite long uh, distances. And as a thank you for your contribution today, we'll shortly be sending you uh, uh, in the post a transcript of the debate um, and a certificate. So I'm uh, going to leave the uh, chamber in a moment in the same way as I came in, uh, but I'd ask the doorkeepers to show you out after I have left. But before I do that, I would like to thank you very much for the contribution uh, that you have made. It has been a really good debate, really, um, as all my colleagues were saying, really uplifting as far as we were concerned. Thank you very much and have a very uh, successful uh, and happy journey back. Thank you. <laughs>